Jason, I'm so excited for this. I can't believe it. You know, it was seven years since we first chatted. So thank you so much for joining me again today. Wow. Well, Harry, it's just, it, it has genuinely been a delight to watch 20 VC just grow and grow over the years. And, uh, you know, it's, if, if it's been seven years, it's a good reminder that overnight success stories take a long time. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> Jason, I feel so fucking old. I wear a hat because my hair is thinning. I've been friend. wondering about the hat on the TikToks. I've been wondering where that hat comes from, but um, do you, yeah. Do you, know, do you know why? Fun fact, we get 28% higher engagement because of the hat. There we go. I see, I see. I see. Now, okay. listen, we're, we're going to do the Algolia story here. So I want to okay. do a little bit of context setting. Sure. Where did you first meet the team? How did you meet them? How did that meeting go? Can you paint that picture for me? Well, first of all, one thing that's pretty, it may be true of you to some extent, because in some ways we invest similarly in some ways, um, but I only invest um, from inbound Saster super fans. Uh, every deal I've tried to go out and get, I've failed. I do nothing outbound. Every warm referral doesn't work out. Nothing works out except the high velocity inbound email uh, my rounds oversubscribed. Would you like to meet? Or I just want to meet with you. And some of well, some of those emails, they're Sony baloney, but the really good ones break through. And every single investment I've done has been a high velocity inbound, including if, we, if we're going to talk about Algolia today, we'll talk about that. My second venture investment. Um, just it's not that I don't think hunting is a good strategy. It's just not good for me. You mentioned about the ones that break through. Yeah. What is it about those that break through that break through? Is it the traction? Is it the team? Are there elements and commonalities which stand out, which make them higher signal for you? What I learned is that the, look, there are exceptions. It's funny. The, um, we did this digital event during COVID with the founders of Monday.com and they asked why yeah. I didn't respond to their inbound email. And I, I'm like, oh my God, how did I miss the one from the Monday founders? And, and obviously, the, and I went back and their inbound email was terrible. It was very interesting. It was a horrible tool. They had a different name before Monday. They were like Harry and Jason's wedding rentals. I'm making it up, but it was a terrible name. They, they, bought, Monday, they bought a great URL, right? And the email was like, you know, we love Saster. We're going to be in town for Saster Annual. Can you meet next week? Those are the worst ones because I got 10,000 people coming to Saster Annual. So th it's not that this is the best strategy, but what I've found with the best investments I've done, Algolia will talk about Tocta, Sales Loft, Greenhouse, um, Gorgeous, um, Pipe Drive, my first investment. Like the best founders are great communicators one way or the other, right? And so if you can write an incredible cold email, like an incredible inbound email, um, you, you, can, you can judge a human being and a company just from that email if it's A+, plus, right? But you'll lose the Mondays. <laughs> like that was my that was my big wake up moment of the limitations which I always knew of this strategy. My was question, this digital event. Yeah. My question is, is there a format for the incredible inbound email? Like Yeah. I, I, yeah. What well, you it? know, it's funny. We did this other event during peak COVID called the New New Adventure, and I actually flipped it around and I asked David Sachs, Keith Ravoy, Aileen Lean, and Sacha Patel, all all for the best, how they handle it. And it was interesting that all of them plus add me like as a distant fifth or whatever, we all gave radically different answers. So I love an incredibly detailed email. Harry, it's Jason Lemkin from this company. We're at 18 K MRR. We're going 29.6% a month. Our NRR is 142%. Our top customers are GE, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Here's our team. Here's where we come from. Here's our story. Here's why we're going to win. Here's what we're doing that matters. Like I like it, a cold email. That's so good that I already want to invest before the meeting. That's how I do. Like every, including now goalie, we're going to talk about it. I already wanted to invest before I met all of my initial unicorns. I all wanted to invest before I met David Sachs was like, um, I just want two lines. What do you do? Um, and Keith Raboy was like, send me a very lengthy deck. I, 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 that's good too. But like, and so it was just interesting to hear the different perspectives, but all of these top investors all loved getting the best cold inbound, right? The, because every, 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 every top investment's an outlier. Everyone's an exception, right? So be thoughtful about the rules you hear, right? Because they may only partly apply to you. I, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I think you're right. Can I ask, when, when you apply that to Algolia, yeah. how, did, how did that come together then? And how did that first meeting take place from the cold email? Uh, I was lucky. I, I, this, um, first of all, th this whole series you're doing is interesting because you go back in time, right? So you have to be thoughtful uh, about what works today. I mean, we're going back to 2014, my second investment, right? The first one was Pipe Drive. They sold for $1.5 billion cash to Vista uh, last year. Um, Algoli today is worth $3 billion. 
probably would would be IPOing if it wasn't for the the markets. But look, it was just the the founders were Saster super fans in the early days, and um, they had come out of Y Combinator. Um, the round was full. They sent me an email a week after demo day. I was lucky. I met them. Um, and I was just in love with the problem, which we'll talk about. I was in love. Algolia does search as a service. It's an API to automate search. And when I was a founder, this was one of my top five headaches was that our search servers built on Lucene would go down every day. Like I wanted to bang my head on the desk. And so when you get some founders that can describe a problem you're passionate about, and they have incredible numbers in the early days, you know, you want to meet and you want to meet in 60 seconds, Right. Um, but the key was staying in your lane. The key, again, was an inbound deal that picked me. I didn't pick them. Um, uh, I actually missed the deal because for a year I had a full-time email reader. I need to get this again. And my email reader said, I don't know too much about this company, but I think you should meet them. You missed this email. And I'm like, oh, you're right. I missed the email. And so we met the next day right before they were back to go back to France um, and then, you know, within five minutes, 10 minutes, of course I knew what I thought was true was accurate. And I said, well, I'll just buy as much of the round as you'll let me. Okay. So if the round was full, sorry, I didn't know that. If the round was full, how were you able to invest? How much did you invest? And what was Look, the I think I was the largest investor in this, in this pre, well, I guess we would call pre-seed round, but I think it was all angels, right. And, and micro funds. So you just rejiggered it, right. You call it, it's the thing that's frustrating when you invest in a YC company sometimes, because I, I'm a, as I'm a, as an ex founder. I'm passionate about YC, but it's also such a game, right? And just everyone finds out. Oh, sorry, your allocation has been reduced fifty percent. Probably what happened. I, I, I it was it was a new it was a new experience for me. But all of a sudden, there was a room to do to do half the round. So how so how much did you put in, and what was the price? Well, that's interesting learning. And again, this is a long time ago, right? So I did only five hundred k in the first round, and I bought up in the next. I did three and a half million in the A. Um, so I did five hundred k in the seed at 12 pre. So it was low ownership, relatively speaking at the time. And there were a bunch of reasons for that. But in a classic YC thing, I got a deal. It was like, you could either do 500K at 12 or a million at 15. And I didn't know it was my second investment. And I was, I was very valuation sensitive. In fact, this deal at the, when I was working at a traditional venture fund, it was seen as very expensive at the time, given that they were like a 10K MRR. And um, so I chose half the amount at 12 instead of double the amount at 15. And that makes sense if you're optimized around small exits, right? Actually, there is a logic to that, right? But now you look back and we laugh today, right? In 22, it's like, well, you could have had, you could have almost doubled your ownership for a modestly higher valuation. Like what a numb nuts. Um, but I was so focused. Not only was I learning in my second venture investment, but I was so worried about losing money, right? And I that, that's a mistake. You got to, you got to, learn like you don't want to go too far you don't want to start off in venture and burn all the money in the first six months but you got to realize how to lose money and for me it took me years years to learn how to lose money years to learn how, and i i didn't even lose any money for five or six years um, but i had to learn how to get my get, wrap my head around it how did you learn how to lose money jason look i'm not the smartest investor out there or the highest velocity honestly i had to get up almost 10x on my initial investments to realize that losing a 1x doesn't matter. I had to get there. I was terrified. As a founder, I was terrified of losing my VC's money. Like I sweated it every day. I raised, oh my God, I raised $8 million in venture capital. I thought the world would end if I lost them a dollar. Did, didn't matter, right? To, to, especially to, I was in emergence too. That's a, like a 12x fund. They didn't care if they lost $4 million on that fund. But I, I worried every day and, and I, I did the same thing. But then once you're up, literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions, at least on paper, if you're a seed investor, you find, I was slow. I finally got the perspective. I'm like, listen, I got to like take a little bit more risk. And, and a lot of the, the, the great GPs that were investors in me then, the Byron Dieters and others were like, you got to take a little more risk, Jason. Like it just doesn't matter. But I was slow. I just had to feel it. And I just, um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose much money until it really did not matter. So the interesting question is 500k at 12. Yeah. Would you have done that deal today? I know how you invest today. Would you have done that deal and taken that ownership? Today? No. Well, there's so many lessons when you start learning. I, I think you and I might've talked about this when you started investing more aggressively. No. I, well, first of all, I would have done the million at 15 in a heartbeat. Right. And that would have been my bare minimum of investment. Right. Cause then I would have owned 8% or something in the company. And uh, no, I would have passed on it. And of course it would have been an error. Right. But um, I'm sitting here at this stage of my investment career and, and really anything under 10%. Um, I, it's hard to take seriously.
it's just hard to take seriously. I will do it if I fall in love with the founder. I will do it if it's a friend. I will do it if there are other reasons, right? Um, frankly, I will do it to help build a more inclusive portfolio. Um, uh, the majority of the companies I've invested in have a woman CEO. And, and right or wrong, I, I, one of the ways I've done that, which is probably not the best way, was to mix and match ownership stakes a little bit. But yet, yeah, if it's not at least 10%, and I want to have... Each in each batch of investments, I want to have at least one as a solo GP that I own twenty percent or more of. Like I want that because honestly, it's the only way you can make enough money. You you want to own twenty. If you if if you're a seed investor and you're a solo GP and you own twenty percent of something worth a couple billion dollars, that's I think what the game of venture is about. And I think if you don't play it to win, you shouldn't you shouldn't play the game unless you need a salary. Do you th do you not worry about adverse selection? The ones where you can get the ten percent plus, the ones where you probably shouldn't. No, I don't worry about it anymore because what I've learned is that, um, like the Algolia one. Listen, Algolia was not the hottest company; it's YC batch, but it was it was probably in whatever the top, the hotter group, but it was not the top one, right? Whatever it was. But the best founders always have multiple options. Even today, even in, even in a growth round today, they, the best, the, the incredible ones have multiple options. And if you're lucky enough that they pick you and you play the adverse selection game, you're, you're playing weird psychodrama in your head. Like, you, you, But you have to believe there's a reason you pick you. The worst, the worst line you get, this is why I don't invest in any founders that don't love Saster because I, I get some Sony baloney line. Like I, I, I talked to this great founder about a Three or four weeks ago, I really want to invest in this company. She, everything was great about these metrics, right? I mean, you'd love it if you saw it. And, and she was like, um, well, I'm still learning about Saster. I'm like, oh, I know this isn't going to work out. <laughs> then we have some sort of weird adverse selection thing where I'm probably either being used as a stocking horse or it's too early in the discovery. And you know what? That deal didn't work out. It, it didn't work out, right? And, and, and I, I ran that experiment one more time this year after nine years of investing to, to, to challenge yourself. And I won't run that experiment again. Like I will only invest in folks that come through the funnel and pick me and I'll do it somewhat poorly. But, um, if you, if you can find a way that just even once a year, one of the truly best founders picks you and you pick and you, and you're smart enough to recognize that, like that's all it takes. If your fund size isn't huge to win in venture, like you need a real unicorn a year with large ownership and the math is magical. But if you don't do that, you're running something for fees. One of the main reasons I think I've seen founders pick their venture investor yeah. is the alignment of realization of problem. You feel the problem of search and they yeah. see that in you. They feel your passion. And you said before about betting on what you know when you go from CEO to VC. Yeah. What did you mean by this, Jason? Yeah, it's the same advice I give to lots of op operators. Um, Look, I came out of a, you know, I, I came out of a second generation SaaS company now called Adobe Sign, and I had, you know, we, we hit a million a month when we sold to Adobe, 12 million a year, growing 100%. And I just, but, but we had a tiny team and I had so many headaches and my biggest headaches were, um, you know, we talked about our search servers going down. We used, we used a, a cool in-browser thing that didn't scale. Then we switched to Lucene, which is basically elastic today, but it was an early deployment and we didn't have the right engineers to make Lucene scale. So, so search was core to our product. And when you'd search in the contract with Harry Stebbings, like it would crash the, 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 the product. And so it just drove me nuts as someone who was very product focused. So I had this problem. Our contact center never really worked. So I invested in Toctex as my third investment worth 10 billion. I invested in Front, which is worth 1.7 billion. I invested in Gorgeous, which is number one contact center in Shopify worth almost a billion. I invested Maestro QA, which will be worth a billion in the not too distant future. So I knew this contact center was one of my headaches, getting my contact center search, contact center. I could never get Salesforce to work for me. So my first investment was Pipedrive for an elegant CRM. Um, and then our whole outbound cadence was broken. So the outreach, sales loft, mix, I invested in sales loft, which exited for two and a half billion uh, last year to Vista as well. These were all like my top headaches. But interestingly, the things that worked well, like payroll, like I remember I was, you know, I met Josh Reeves really early. He was such a good CEO, right? Really early. He didn't ask me to invest, but I remember met him early, but I didn't get the problem because it wasn't a problem I had as founders. My payroll always worked just fine. <laughs> this wasn't even in my hundred top hundred problems. So I knew there were HR issues. I knew recruiting was hard. So I was involved with Greenhouse, which sold for 800 million very early pre-revenue, right? Because I got that, but I just didn't get payroll. I didn't get a whole bunch of other things that worked really well. I didn't even get parts of web design because I had a great designer. 
Um, so it sounds silly, but when I talk to folks that come out of different uh, success stories, um, I'm like, just don't, don't, don't do what a lot of VCs say, which is wait a year, slow it down, take it easy. Like, no, I'm like, invest in like five companies your first year that are your top problems where you have this special insight and you'll know who the best founders are in that space too, because they can't bullshit you. They can't bullshit you because you know, because you just saw your search servers go down four times a week. So when this group of French co-founders come in and they can explain to you exactly why you had your problem and why their product is 10 times faster and can deployed in, be deployed in an hour when we've been spending two years trying to get this to work and it doesn't work and this is 10 times faster in one hour. I mean, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you buy every share you can. So, but, but I will say today, you know, it's funny today that's in some ways that's decayed, right? I know a lot about community with Saster as you do, right? And I remember you made a comment to me not too long ago that you should have invested in Riverside that we're on, right? Because you knew the space so well. So that was your mistake, right? But as investors, as folks that have gone from CEO to VC, you got about two years before you'll understand the problem, right? You'll understand the problem, but not necessarily what's next generation, right? Like my head of customer success, like we used New Relic very early and I begged my head of customer success to go there next, but I'm not sure I would have understood Datadog, right? It was one generation. I would have got the problem, but I wouldn't have been able to say Datadog would be huge, even though I knew New Relic would be. So you got this two-year window. Can I ask, how do you retain that plasticity? Like when you look at yourself now, you know, you haven't been a SaaS CEO for many yeah. years. You've been a venture investor for many years. Yeah. So you don't have the pain points and you don't know what is front and center for SaaS CEOs because you're not living it. How do you think about retaining that awareness of pain? First of all, I think it is, I, let's be clear, my opinion, and I think I see this around, is I actually think it is permanent decay for VCs. I don't <laughs> think you can retain it. You can retain a curious mind which I think is critical to this, right? A curious mind, which we can talk about knee next I have, but maybe there's a reason I've done six contact center investments in a row because I, I, I can't think of something new. I just keep reliving my pain. I can't find six search investments, search APIs, but I can find contact center keeps, keeps remaking itself. Um, you know, it's, it's the second or third largest category of software. So if you just wait, like I waited, okay, well, Shopify is taking off. What's going to be number one on Shopify? Well, that's gorgeous. Now they have 11,000 customers on Shopify. It's, you don't need like the, the biggest degree to relive your pain. We all can relive our pain again and again, but I think it's an existential issue. And I think anyone that says I, I, it isn't, I think is uh, kind of full of it. You can either build a team under you that's close to the problem. Right. Which is what I suspect David Sachs has done. I mean, off the charts, brilliant. Right. As a SASIO. But I think his team keeps him fresh and alive. Right. That's closer to it. But I think it's risky and you and you probably have to all converge on a more traditional venture playbook. And I struggle with that. Right. The only thing that helps is, look, both you and I are doing something quirky, which is we are attempting to run operating businesses and communities at the same time as we're investing. Right. So Saster Inc. will do 40 million this year. So there are a set of issues, a set of issues around sales compensation we're going to talk about when we get off this year, commissions. Um, I, I really understand CMOs problems because we have 200 CMOs that we work with, right? But, it, but it's a narrow set of Riverside-esque investments that you get out of it, but it does keep me fresh. I understand the pain of having rebuilt a sales team, right, that closed 30-something million. Uh, I know the issues there. I feel young, in a sense, in that, in that area. But, but parts of the tech stack... Yeah, you get like you age out of a lot of things in venture. You really do. And if you're not honest about it, I think you just end up in a fee milking vehicle. Why can't you just invest in another C vent? <laughs> um, but uh, no, listen, I totally agree with you. Unbelievable. I didn't know about the 40 million. I do yeah. want to ask that, you know, you mentioned there about doing four or five in your first year, really taking advantage of knowing the pain. Is yeah. there any other bits of advice that you give to operators turned VCs in their first year of transition? Yeah, I would say. One, don't listen to the advice to slow it down, right? A lot, if you join a larger fund, their incentives are different than yours, right? You're new. The, the ball is set. They're just hoping – a large fund is hoping in the next two years you find one, one notion. That's all they care about and that you don't create a lot of drama or headaches, right? They're only looking for one. That's all they need out of adding you. So your incentives are – you want 10 so that you can get a couple unicorns and get, and get, your, um, and get your track record going. So, so invest in as many as you can even if you have to – even if the ownership is suboptimal, even if you have to join a syndicate you wouldn't want to, even if you have to do a few as an angel, just just do all the good ones. Um, and the second piece of advice is, and um, I think actually this is a rule I've bent over time and regret it every single time I do, um, they have to be better than you. 
so this is the rule that only operators get and founders and VCs do. When I tell this to the most successful VCs, they don't get what I'm talking about or the almost successful ones. You have to invest in CEOs that were better than you. If you know the problem, if I, if I know, if, if, I'm, if I'm a podcaster and I know Riverside or whatever the other versions are, and I, and I oh, look, Riverside's great. We're on it today. And you meet the CEO who I don't know, and he's not better than you, Harry. You shouldn't invest. But if you meet the CEO of Riverside, and my God, you're, you just know that whether he's 5% or she's 5% better than you or 50%, but they're better than you, and you've already had a decent outcome as a founder, you can't lose in those ones. You can't lose in those. So for, you know, we're, we're jumping around a lot, but if we go back to Algolia, and again, this was the first venture investment I did when, when it was unanimously no, and I still did it. But the founders were clearly better than me. The traction was better than I had. The understanding of the problem was better than I had as a founder, like adjusted for time, and they were better than me. They were better than me. And I've never, and, and, and where you can, the mistakes I've made is whether there's traction or the product's cool, but the founders aren't better than me because this stuff's so hard. It's so competitive. It's so agile that if the founders aren't better than you, in two to three years, the, the products decayed with, against the competition. Okay, so the founders were better than you. Yeah. But we're going to get onto the partnership wanting to do it. The yeah. other element, though, that there's a couple of elements we're going to dig into, but like competition is always one that VCs spend a lot of time on. Yes. When you look at the competition, you were competing with free. Tough yes. competition. How did you answer the question of how Algolia would beat free alternatives and get comfortable with that? Yeah, I actually think it would be even, you know, I think, I do think competing with open source is really complicated, right? Yeah. I feel like I'm a tiny bit smarter about it today, although I haven't done as many commercial open source investments as I wish I had. Competing with free is both tough and wonderful because it, it cuts through the Sony baloney. Like if you, if your product, if you're competing with a world-class open source product and you are getting inc relatively incredible traction in the early days, that means your product rocks for some use case. It's not going to be the best for everything, right? It cannot be the best for everything, but there must be some segment, some sliver where you are literally 10 X better than, or you would never get any traction, right? Everyone's going to futz around with the free version. So there's probably no better signal than when you compete with a free open source platform and your product is exploding even at an early day because it's, it's got to be magical. It has yeah. to be magical on some axis. So actually, like, yeah, hard on the founders, but easier on the VC. <laughs> You know, you 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 can't buy that traction typically. You can't buy it with marketing dollars. You can't buy it with referral games. You can't get it like EchoSign and DocuSign did in the early days because there's nothing else. So you tolerate a horrible product. Um, it has to be magical from the beginning. Can I ask? You know, so many founders present the you know two by two matrix with them in the top right hand corner yeah. alone. You know, when you think about the way that founders present comp competition and competitive landscapes. What advice would you give them in terms of how to present competition the right way to potential investors? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, I'll answer it two things. First of all, most of those two by two matrices are throwaway slides. Don't have a throwaway slide. Don't have, it's a, it, not only is it a waste of everyone's time, but it, it, it makes you, it makes you look less than great. If you have a throwaway slide, if you, if you can't come up with, let's step back for a minute. If you can't come up with a two by two matrix, do it a different way. Do it in text. Do it in a 10,000 line memo if you have to. Um, do it in a comic book uh, r graphic. But, but don't, if you, the two by two doesn't work for you, and a two by two is a construct, right? If it doesn't work for you, don't do it that way because there's nothing worse than when I see a competitive slide and I see the two by two and it just, I, I, the axes make no sense. I'm like, ugh, okay, this, this, I don't want to do this one. <laughs> Because, because here's the thing about competition. I can think back vividly on the handful of investments I've made that haven't worked out. I can remember how they've answered the competitive questions and it's always been mediocre. Um, the best founders know their competition cold and they respect it. They respect it. Now, maybe in B2C, it's different. I don't know. But in B2B, you, you know, for example, one of the things I loved about Algolia was before I even met them, they had this iconical piece of content marketing back when we barely knew what content marketing was. And it said Algolia versus Elasticsearch, which is free. And they explained quite honestly where Algolia won and where it didn't, where you should use each product. It was data-driven in terms of spec for search time and everything. And they said, hey, listen, for these use cases, do not use Algolia. Okay. This was not a, 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 a VP of product marketing that doesn't even know what the product does. This was, and it worked. It got them tons of leads and because people would type in elastic competitor or, or, and then they would find out. So it, it worked, but that's what you want. You want founders that profoundly respect the competition and they know exactly today where they sit in the market. And they know in three or four years 
where that white space is going. And that's what you want out of a competition slide. Who cares? Everyone has some, between two and 2,000 competitors. I want to know how, why you're breaking out and where it's going to go. And then your jaw drops because 95% of founders fail that, fail that exercise. For me, the thing that I always run away from is kind of commoditization products. And what I mean by that is products where it's just a race to the bottom. Now, you could see payment processing as part of that. I know many investors lost on Stripe and Adyen because they viewed the market as that. Yeah. But how do you feel about commoditization products where it simply is a race to the bottom? Listen, I'm with you and, uh, you know, all things being equal, I'd rather have a product that hits small, medium, and large customers, right? And, and, and has a bit of a mid-market or enterprise element that isn't very low end or race to the bottom. But I also think that is an, a VCism. And, and you're going to lose great deals due to VCisms. All these VCisms are, are truths. And, you know, when I started investing, they harked back to the dot bomb era when everyone knew things didn't work. Um, I don't know where we're harking back now to 2016, 2017. There was a famous tweet that David Sachs had um, before he started investing in craft that all the good ideas in SaaS were done after he sold Yammer because yeah, this was, I, you know, we were of the same CO class and it seemed like for a couple of years there, it was done. Like all the categories had been built out until maybe 2015. And so my point is this race to the bottom thing, like, is it true or is the fact that Stripe's API was so elegant and disruptive and that they could build so much functionality around it that why would you use anything else? Um, maybe maybe we missed the whole point and that this is not a – I do not believe Stripe is a commodity, right, uh, whatsoever. And um, if I were building a SaaS company today from scratch – and, and I, sh I wish I'd invested in Stripe because this was also in my top 10 problems as a founder was payment processing. I would use – I wouldn't even – I, if, if anyone, if my engineering team wanted to use anything but Stripe, I would really challenge them. I'm like, it's proven. It works. Everyone uses it. I, I'm in. I don't even care what the fees are that much. There might be, they're like, they might say, hey, look, use something like Pilot that can handle billing and automation too. And they might, can, I might do that, right? But for the pure API piece, no. So I don't know that this, this, this race to the bottom thing, it, like you, 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 you might just miss some things. Uh, all these, the, the tough thing is all these VCisms are accurate and they'll all lead you to miss deals. You said VC is in there multiple times. What yeah. are any of the other mistakes that VCs make or you always laugh at when you hear them talk about competition? I think the one, look, I, I'll give you a version of it. The, the one that we all hate, of course, of the old, the old, old version of is why wouldn't Microsoft or Google or whomever do this, right? Then it became, why wouldn't, then it became, why wouldn't Salesforce do this? Like, you know, I, I was involved, invested in sales off pre-revenue, right? We sold for two and a half billion last year. Everyone thought this was a terrible category. Sales often outreach. Outreach is worth $4 billion. They all thought it was a terrible category because, of course, Salesforce is going to do this. Of course, like automating sales communication with customers, like why would the number one CRM not do this? There's no way they're going to let these guys get big enough before it's, it's just built into Salesforce, right? So why wouldn't they do it, right? Why, why, could, why should Calendly even exist? Google should have built that, right? That that is so true. I mean, Calendly why, why, why? I mean, listen, Tope had a couple incredible workflow insights in this product that, that, that were profound, but you know, like, so, so that's the ism, like the worst ism is why didn't somebody do it? And I think that you can ask that question in a thoughtful way, but it's a lazy question if you don't, if you don't ask it in a thoughtful way. Right. I, I want to know why it's not, it's not, tell me why didn't Google build it? Just, just so I, I always use the Columbo type approach. Like, I honestly don't know. Like why, why do you think Google has not built this into their calendaring function? Ask the question. Why haven't, why doesn't Salesforce built sales after outreach back in the day? It seems so core. Tell me why they haven't built it. Right. And the smart founders will actually tell you why they didn't build it. Can I ask, have you ever had a portfolio company been smoked by competition? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, I have. I, th I think I've had, well, I've had a couple. And then I've had one that wasn't, even though they were slow, which is interesting, which was my first one, Pipe Drive, so we can contrast them. Yes, they're all smoke. Like, the, the, the fact is what they say on, this VCism is true. But, but really, it's only the operators that say this, which is it really is the folks that can iterate more rapidly that win. Um, you know, whatever you use, let's say you use story points and let's say you put out four, 40 really high quality story points a quarter, whatever, however you measure it. And, and, and your competition puts out 30. Okay. But think how that compounds over two years. 
it compounds and you find a way to double your team. So by the end of year one, you're doing 80 and they're doing 30 and then you're doing 160 and they're doing 30. But then think about the amazing things you, you pushed out, right? The Shopify integration and the mobile features and all of this. And they're, they're struggling to keep up with bugs and feature gaps and the pretty good teams get it done, but they complain all the time about how hard it is, how hard it is to launch the integration, how hard it, but they still do it. The great teams just, they, your jaw drops what, what they ship each month. In B2B, it's easier in B2C. In B2B, your jaw drops. And then the mediocre teams, like nothing happens. And the, the product is frozen in time. And, and uh, you know, Evernote, we know we, Evernote just got acquired, right? We just watched that after all these years. And Evernote was so, it, it, maybe it was before you were using it, it was so disruptive when it came out. Everyone in the internet used Evernote, especially for clippings. Like every smart person. It was the notion of its day, not just because they're similar, but because it was so cool. And I, probably because the founder turned over and there were other turnovers, it was never able to re-innovate ever again. Like it lost a, a, a innovation, but the best ones keep going. And Notion is Notion's nothing like it was when we started using it for our team. Can I ask, pre-product market fit, is speed still everything? Because there's the idea of crafting, testing, making sure yes. you hone that customer message. And then when you get product it market, is. go. It is. Would you actually say, it okay, is. Because um, the faster you can iterate, the faster you get into market, and the more tests you can run. I know Figma spent seven years crafting their product in, in closed beta. But first of all, I'm not sure that story is completely true. I bet if we got Dylan back together and we really picked at it, it wasn't like I bet he actually got some version of it out early. And I bet before this version one came out, there were 25 versions. Now, I might be wrong, but I'll bet you there's 25 versions that went out. Um, cause you want those reps, you need those iterations and however you do it, whether it's with friends, beta customers, users, otherwise when you launch, like th this was my stress point when I launched as a SaaS founder, we burnt half our money before we launched and luckily it wasn't all of it. It was a different time, but, but what I knew, and I pushed the team really hard to launch too early. It was a mistake. We still launched too early, but I knew we would run out of iterations. I knew our, our initial launch was not going to be the right product. No one had ever really done e-signatures at scale back then. DocuSign was a Windows printer driver. Like we were doing something kind of innovative. And I knew as cool as the product was that we were using, it was not going to be monetizable the way it was. So I wanted three or four iterations. And I knew I had about 24 months total of time to do it, right? So I, I shoved our product out the door after six months. My team almost killed me. It was a mistake. But it gave me 18 months to get to 2 million in revenue in a sellable product, like a minimum sellable product. So the better the team is, the more those iterations you get. In. And it's just, it's, it's wonderful when you see it happen because they, they just have this leg up. Can I ask, Jason, you mentioned there about burning half the money before the launch. We've seen a whole generation of SaaS companies raise you know, 50 million plus with, I don't know, 30 to 500K in ARR in that range. So really pre-PMF still. What happens to them who've raised that much at 150 million plus? What happens? I don't know. I, I literally, for better or worse, I, I've invested in none of them. So I can't tell you empirically as, as I, I, I'm scrappy. Uh, I don't see any way any of them succeed. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned. I'll take it back. I might've done one investment vaguely similar. What I mean is what, however you define this term zombie, I do worry about zombies. Zombies are the ones that took advantage of a valuation last year, whether they raised 50 or 100 or they raised 30, right? Um, now they have infinite runway. They have runway forever. And, um, and when you get an investor update is, you know, good, bad news is we're not growing, Harry. We're, our growth has dropped from 150% to 0%. The good news is we have 10 years of runway. So we're going to take the next couple years to kind of think like this lack, it creates these zombies have a lack of urgency, I think. And I think the VCs have kind of given up in the old days. The VCs would be all stressed and yelling at them, bring in a new CEO, liquidate the company. I, I think VCs just want to ignore their zombies for the, for the moment because they have bigger, they have bigger problems to solve than their zombies. Right. But also, but also for VCs, it's not a problem. There is no ex existential crisis. It, you can tell your LPs they're figuring it out. They have lots of runway. Yeah, you can hide it from your LPs. Yeah. You know, it's it's not a crisis. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? I think it is not a crisis. Um, I will say that personally, the handful of things I have that are vaguely like that, I wish I could get my money back and put them into another investment, though. Well, so what I'm seeing now, I, want, is I would like, it's not that I'm worried that, 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 that about it, but like, I'm like, gosh, like even if it's just a couple million bucks, what if I could have put that into a breakout seed company that could do a lot with $2 million, right? Instead of this zombie $2 million is just lost zombie in a fire and across the, the wilderness, the Arctic for the next seven years.
But man, I'm seeing this. I've seen four in the last month where the Series yeah. B investors have come back and said, hey, Jason, it's not your fault. It's our fault. But it's not working. Give us the money back. We'll give right. you a million in secondary. Go on your way and we support you. That's a good Lots deal. And we all win. We fucked up. It's not you. I haven't it's been part of one of those, but if that's common, th I think that's that's like the, the Elon Musk's offer to the Twitter, take your take your 90 days now and don't show up on Saturday. Like if the founders want a million dollars rather than to not keep going, it's a great incentive alignment because that's a lot of money. And the VCs get 30 million back. They get they probably don't get one X though in that scenario, or the math wouldn't work. That's that's the part I don't totally get. Um, but uh it's better than none X, right? Totally. Well, if you get 0.8x back, you know what? Actually, you know it's going to be a zombie anyway. Take the 0.8x back. But yeah. my favorite thing is all the founders are like, fuck you. No. I'm really? like, oh, I, yeah. I was like, oh, I would not do that. I would take it. It's not a good. So I totally agree with you there. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how this goes off schedule. Um, I do want to go back to, to Algolia though, because like market size is another one where there's yeah. a lot of VC isms. Algolia's market size, I read your tweet about this, it was $2 million, I think it was. Yeah, it was funny. It was, that was a learning. When the, the first one was pipe drive. So you don't have to do a TAM analysis for CRM. It's the, it's, you know, it, at least back then it was the largest category of software. So you really don't have to do the world's smartest uh, TAM analysis, it's like, okay, who's in the next generation of SMB CRM? Who seems to have the most traction? That's this one, pipe drive. Okay, like that's the end of your TAM analysis. Algolia, I knew this, again, this was one of my top problems as a CEO was getting search to work as an API, but you know, you had, to, you basically had two, three competitors at the time. You had uh, versions of Elastic, which was a services business, so it's free. Um, you had a deprecated Google product no one was using. Okay, so that doesn't really count. And then you had weird niche offerings from Amazon that weren't directly competitive, but the best I could tell was doing $2 million in revenue. So all of these products together were doing $2 million. Um, you could You could have looked at it differently. You could have looked at some things happening in e-commerce and called them search-related products that were bigger, um, which would have been a, a more thoughtful way to do it. But literally the TAM was $2 million. And I was deeply challenged on this. I'm like, okay, listen, obviously like search is an important part of the internet. Like it's how we all got on the internet, right? Was, was hopping into Google or even Yahoo back in the day. It's, it's the onboarding, but for this B2B thing, like I don't get it. And like, here was my dumb guy math. I'm like, okay, listen, these guys are at 12K MRR by the time we're going to do the deal. And they're growing consistently 25% a month. Now, on the one hand, that's, that may not be statistically significant. At, at, we can talk about it. But let's do a line. It is impossible for the TAM to be $2 million. <laughs> They will approach 100% market share way too rapidly if they are growing at 12 to 20% a month, even at a couple hundred K in ARR. It's not mathematically possible. And it sounds silly, but what I, what I have learned is that you know, hyper growth in the early days can decay for a variety of reasons, right? But it does prove you have a large TAM. It always proves to me that if you grow quickly in the early days, you have a large TAM, even if it looks small, you're read and all these categories get bigger, right? Um, you know, even e-signature is not to talk too much about the old days, but like that was a $1 million TAM, right? And today it's a $6 billion business, but the technology remakes categories again and again and again. So you have to, you, you either have to be smarter than me and figure out how, like all these navel gazers are figuring out how web four is going to remake categories or this t hyper growth in the early days, it's good enough for me. That's all I need to know for TAM. Like, that's all I need to know. You speak about kind of the hyper growth in the early days being a real signal. I think you've spoken before. I think it was about pipe drive and kind of how they've plateaued at certain points in the journey. Yeah. My question to you is like, what are the number one or two drivers why companies go from hyper growth to plateau? Why do they plateau? Well, I think they, they all do. I mean, a few haven't, but every single company I've invested in, every un true unicorn, 100 million more revenue or billion more cash exit, all of them have had a plateau year, um, huh. all 100%. And others have tell other stories, but um, it's always it's always a combination of, well, it's almost, it's really always not rebooting the management team. That's the real answer. It's always sticking with the 1.0 management team too long. Or Algoli, if we're talking about Algoli, Nicholas was very clear on this. He waited until 40 million to build his first management team. That was way too long. And Nicholas's problem, and he's been very direct about that, and this is a wildly successful company doing hundreds of millions. The problem is when you wait too long, here's another problem founders have. If you wait too long to build your management team, it's like it's kind of like the product conversation we had earlier. You don't give yourself another chance because if your first management team doesn't work out and you, and you recruit them at 5 million, 
Okay. You got another chance. Like it's painful, but if you, a lot of founders these days in the boom, actually they waited, they waited to hire a real VP of sales or especially a VP of marketing or VP of product. And then you, sometimes you don't get that extra chance if, when you screw it up because you lose a year with every bad VP, you hire two bad VPs, you might lose a year and a half. And so timing the, your, your second management team, it, that's really the plateau. You know, the underlying issue is often not expanding your TAM enough, not expanding your surface area, not going enterprise enough, not building a second product. Like we see all these root causes, but the great management teams figure it out. The great management teams figure out when to go up market, when to add a second product, when they, they figure that, that what looks like the reasons, it's all really the management team. Jason, do you have many of your winners that still have the founders as the CEOs? When I think through the winners that you have. All but one. Most, all but one. Yeah, all so but Algolia that we're talking about. Nicholas did, did step down as they were approaching 100 million and Bernadette took over. And it's been fascinating learning for me because it's only one. Well, I mean, did Timo at Pipe Drive was he CEO? Oh, the end? I forgot. Yeah, Pipe Drive. Pipe, there were a lot of CEOs at Pipe Drive. You're right. Okay. Timo came back and he came. That, that, I take that one out because it was my first investment and I made so many mistakes. We could have a different podcast, all the mistakes you made on your first investment. And Pipe Drive, I made every mistake you can make as a VC. I made all of them and I, I would not make them. I immediately course corrected on the number two Algolia. I, the, the, they, and they're all, they all could be summarized by being as acting like a VC. Talk to me about that. What do you mean by that? I acted... Like, uh, you know, they, I, I wasn't sure it was worth my time. I would tell them how to raise money. I would tell them this thing and that thing. And, um, I, I dressed like a VC for a couple months, uh, and it just didn't fit. The, the, the outfit didn't fit. Um, and, what, um, what's wrong with telling them how to raise money? Surely we're here to help coach some fun rates. I think as a VC, look, you got to. And look, it's, it's harder these days when things are stressful in the markets. you got to give the best advice you can, time the way you can. And once every two years, you have to give some arse-kicking advice, which I hate doing because I'm usually the only one left these days that'll do it. Every two years, you have to give some arse-kicking advice. But then they got to just run with it. It's their company, right? But there is this – when I grew up as a founder, VCs were still much more patriar patriarchal and patronizing than they are today. They're still patronizing today, but boy, it used to be worse. And I still, I still had a, that a bit of the abused founder in me by being abused by, my, by a couple of generations of VCs where I, I acted a little bit like that, and then I immediately saw what I did. And I'm like, I could never, never do this again. I'm just – I'm here to and, – and it helped going to one of the conversations we had actually before we started. It helped that my second investment, I wasn't on the board, interestingly. Right. Because then talk desk, I was my third. It allowed me to have a more aligned collaboration with the founders than I might have had if I were Excel, the largest investor. Right. That's a, an interesting learning. So I course corrected. But um, I see I, I would I would disagree on the patronizing. Well, maybe I'm sure they're patronizing. But I find today I've had one which has not gone well recently. Yeah. And I say to the other investors, why are we not doing more? And they go, oh, Harry, it's a bad look. It's a bad look to They're say right. That. We're, you and I are wrong, and they are right. Well, fuck off. I don't want to be part of a business where we just say, yeah, sure, we're happy to actually not oblige by our fiduciary responsibility and actually not do what's best for the company. I'm going to say the hard truth, Jason, and say you should be on I TikTok. I know, Harry, and I think, I think, I think, I, 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 I th time will tell whether we're right. Um, I, 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 it's funny, I put this on Twitter yesterday and um this tough conversation right and maybe the sixth investment i did is a company called logical um i love this company it's e-discovery but it'll take a long time to get, it'll get to 100 million it's worth hundreds of millions for real but it's not it's it, it it's on a thoughtful growth it's never raised again and and andy's like yeah you gave me that kick in the ass conversation in 2017 and i i i i needed it and i'll and i and i'm grateful but he still remembered it as a hard kick in the ass in 2017 and i realized there's this line and i would say the very best founders, the top, and not the very best. Uh, well, you're hopefully you're investing in pretty good founders, right? So you're already in kind of this 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 Ivy League segment. But I would say even of this Ivy League of venture back founders, I would say only maybe fifteen percent really can take the feedback, and uh, twenty five percent will tolerate it, and then sixty percent will hate you for it. They hate you for it, and that's why all the other folks in the room say nothing, Harry. And I try to say literally. I had a tough board meeting. Uh, about a month and a half ago and the founders asked me eight times what do you think Jason I'm like I I'm just not I'm gonna pass I'm gonna take a pass on this, this, this discussion I said you literally you do not want to hear what I have to say I gotta be honest you don't trust me you don't want to hear what I have to say like they kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me and finally I was clear it's like I love what you guys are doing 
but your burn rate's unsustainable. And if you don't make you don't have to make a change this week, right? You have a lot of, but if you don't make a change in the next 30 days, it, you will fail. And here are the 10 reasons you'll fail. And they're upset with me to this day. And um, the Andy's from Logical, I, I'm glad he wasn't. We bailed out the company when he spent too much money. And, uh, but I would say the majority of the time I've had to be the ass kicker, the relationship is damaged permanently. And not with the best ones, right? Not with the Algolias like we're talking about, but uh, with more than I would have expected, Harry. And is it worth it? I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure it's worth it. I, I just want your thoughts. So when you go to an enterprise customer and you fucked up or the product's SSO is not working or whatever permission is not working, they're going to kick your fucking ass. And if you are a child and can't take that, well, you're not going to have very good enterprise division. You're going to have great engineers, great employees who are going to advise you on your leadership and how it could be improved. If you can't take that, you're not going to be a very good leader. So stop being yeah. a child. Like help me, like that's indicative that they just can't take feedback. And then you know what? Fine, we'll point to anomalies like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, but predominantly, especially in B two B, that's actually just a sign of a bad leader. Maybe I, 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 it's not. I also think that the 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 board member CEO relationship is a nuanced one. It's complicated what it means and how it works. And I would say most folks. I, my feedback's always honest. It's always from the heart. It's there's never any malice, and and, and if we lose the money, it's fine. Like it, it really, it's it, it's, it's it's relatively trivial for me compared to the founder. But most most folks take months to deliver tough feedback. The truth is, this is the VC approach in twenty you know twenty twenty two twenty is like give the tough feedback, but hint at it, get into it. Uh, tell them maybe this and then and then talk about the big tough layoff meeting in, in two months it's it's the, and I, that's i'm not that i'm like i i just do you really want my and then the, I, i'm asked do you really and then they you know you get it but um i just don't have the 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 patience to sugarcoat the the honesty it's not even it, 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 but but it's tough i don't know that that's right i think that VCs, you know, they're, they have a, they have a peculiar relationship with startups and it, maybe it makes sense to sugarcoat your feedback over three months. Um, and in the end of the day, as a manager, and I don't know that VCs are managers, it's always better if your report comes to the conclusion themselves. It's always worse if you have to tell them the answer, like you, you don't want to do that. And so VCs are so weird. We have these board meetings every two months and I, we don't have the daily meetings to kind of hope that in a month or two, your VP of sales realizes Jack and, and Jill aren't going to work out. Like the problem is it's, it, there's, there's these, these punctuated moments in time. And if you don't speak up, you can try it out of, out of band. Don't get me wrong. You can pick up the phone, but sometimes three months later is pretty late. Yeah, right? I mean, you, you, tough. You, said, you, you said about speaking up there, you spoke up in your partnership when no one else wanted to do Algolia. Yeah. Talk to me about the internal discussions there and how you got it over the line when you were the only one and it was your second investment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, it's, there's a bunch, first of all, I don't mean that to be critical. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's just a learning. There's lots of investments that won't be, you know, and it was interesting. My third investment was talk to us, which is worth 10 billion today. That one was so unanimous that, you know, th th it was a yes before he left the building. Right. Um, so, but both, both will probably end up being equally successful. Right. So number two was, was all no. Number three was all yes. Nothing else I did was unanimous. Right. Maybe the lesson is, you know, one of the VC isms I hate is conviction right? Because conviction can, can justify so much sloppy thinking, but it doesn't mean it's wrong, right? And I was 100% sure this investment was, was going to be successful, and I'll go, I had zero doubts. Um, I had lived the problem. My colleagues had not lived the problem at the time. They were right about the TAM. They were right about some other things. They were wrong about a few things we could chat about too, but um, you know, it was, uh, I was willing, I, w I was so sure this would be successful that I was willing to take whatever hits it took to, to push it through. Do you think investment partnerships are the best decision-making bodies? You have one person like you in this case with the, yes. the main expertise, the relationship, the knowledge, and then the other partnership, which not specific to this, but just generally, they don't have the relationship. They often don't have the knowledge. They may be specialized somewhere else. And it's a very different level yeah. of knowledge barriers are they the best structures to make the best decisions? Well, look, here's the thing about what I've learned, what I've thought about this over the years. I think, forget about VC. In most true part, think about real partnerships, you know, how many partners are there typically? Two. That's the right number. So VCs are legal partnerships, but I think once they're beyond two, 
they become dysfunctional. Almost they have to be dysfunctional. You start to lose, or at a minimum, you're only there because of the fun size because it you lose all the benefits of a partner once you're past. Now, there are th- great three co-founder startups, right? But um, even three, it's usually two plus one, right? So that's the problem is this corruption. We confuse the term. And I think, look, if you're going to deploy half a billion dollars traditionally, you know, you'd need at least five GPs to do that. That's the way the math, you know, there, there's, there's crazy exceptions the last couple of years. But so you, you had to kind of do it for the kids, for the LPs. And then you had to find a way for this to work. But no, I don't think when you have more than two partners that it's particularly helpful for. But I do think, too, I think I would have been a much better investor. We were talking about this before we started. I would have been a much better investor with a partner than as a solo GP. I'll say it with 100% certainty. 100% certainty. I would have been better. I'm going to do fine. Don't get me wrong. No, no, I will do well. But I, I could have had a fund or two for the ages if I'd had a partner. And I just, I just, just when I did not have a co-founder as a founder, I was less successful. It's, it's the same, it's the same thing. Although it might not be the question you're asking. Why did you not then? Look, the weird thing about venture is you got to pick one of two types of partners, right? You can either pick someone that's as established as you, in which case the timing has to be right. Like, are they going to leave, are they going to leave Sequoia to join 20 VC? Well, it might seem exciting, but whoa, you know, how much are they vested into it, Sequoia? I mean, you don't even want to know the numbers, right? So uh, there, are, there are one or two people I thought about working with, but what they would leave behind was uh, made, made no sense. I, I wasn't even comfortable with it at the time, right? Then there's the up-and-comer, and that's what you want to do nine times out of ten anyway, right, is bet, is bet on the up-and-comer. I, I, I did some experiments there, both of which were successful, like, like, but they end up on their own journey. And sometimes that journey is not synergistic with the way you're running your fund, right? And so, yeah, I consider it a failing that I did not, as an investor, find a co-founder. We can call them a partner, right? But I do consider it a failing not finding finding a, a co-founder because the best co-founders are mega accretive. They're, they're mega find, accretive. Do you find it lonely? Investing? No, yeah. because just running Sasser overall is is so rewarding and enriching and complicated and nuanced. And I'm talking with so many great people that that... that fills up every mental, every energy I have is the, is the community side. So, so no, I just know I would be a better investor with, with a true co-founder. You mentioned doing it for the kids being yeah. the LPs. Yeah. Uh, Samuel said on the show the other day from Haystack, we're about to see the greatest LP churn ever with all LP books overweight on venture. And the churn in this next wave will be phenomenal. Well, huge, yeah. not phenomenal, but huge. Do you agree with him? And how do you expect LP markets to move in the next 12 months? No, I don't think I, well, first of all, look, Semmel is not only wildly successful, but he's a student of this stuff, right? I mean, he's literally, it's great. I've considered myself a student of SAS. I consider Semmel a student of how LPs are put together and funds are constructed. So he's right. I can just tell you from my vantage point, I don't think so. Um, I think the LPs I have are pretty well established institutions that have been investing in venture for decades and decades. Um, I, I have one that experienced some stress during this period, right? But it's someone that's n- s- relatively newer of my LP stack. Um, I have the exact same LPs across multiple funds, no change. Uh, some, some losses, right? Uh, but, but, but basically the others just took up the slack, so no new LPs. And I just think that folks that have been in this category for decades, um, uh, they may drop managers if that's the point. Like managers are going to get dropped. Don't get me wrong. Like it's going to be brutal, right? But they're not. They're not going to not remain committed to the asset class. Um, and uh, I remember talking like to Horsley Bridge when things went pretty far south, and they're like, "Well, we've done an exhaustive analysis again of everything since we've been doing venture, right?" And they're like, "There's just this type of manager is still going to outperform every other asset class." Now they're a fund of funds. You can argue they're biased, but. Uh, I think th- this this capital house look the, the LP LP at the fact that LPs made eighty top LPs made eighty to ninety percent IR last year was insane. Like that should have been a flag to every LP on the planet instead of doing victory laps and committing more to the asset class. But it's really the only way they're gonna beat Nasdaq on this side. Some combination of P and VC, and and otherwise you you, you got to do it. You got you got to deploy the capital. So. Um, but boy, you know, this is what I learned before the, the boom. There, you know, we, we talk about the boom in venture, but we're missing the, but we're missing the boom in all the managers, right? That's such a boom in managers and so many are going to get dropped. 
And really good funds used to, in the old days, people would drop Excel and they would drop everything but Sequoia. And then, and then you would think, oh my God, I, like I dropped out of Excel after the Facebook fund. That was like a career limiting move, but people are going to drop out of everything. They're going to drop out of Andreessen. And it's not because these aren't great funds. There's just stress in the market, right? But it doesn't mean that these the best LPs are going anywhere. I mean, with a four and a half billion dollar crypto fund, I'm not surprised they drop out of Andreessen. Yeah, but, but they'll come But they'll come back. They'll, like if you look at the overall numbers for Andreessen, I'm shocked at how wildly successful Andreessen has been across these funds as they've grown. Wildly successful. That their blended returns are like 3.5x net after all these years. Pretty darn, pretty darn good at that scale. Pretty darn. And 3.5x net beats everything, Harry. That's the thing. Like we throw, the other thing is the last couple of years, everyone was so brilliant. We would throw out 3x, 4x, 5x, 6x. I'm going to have a 10. Every, every new VC that never had a fund was their, their, their deck was, I'm going to raise an 8x fund. I'm like, do you even know what that means? Right. There's a reason 3x net used to be rare until the boom. It's because that beats everything. 3x net beats every other asset class except exotic, except timber in good years or diamonds in odd years. 3x net beats everything. And 3x net is used to be rare and will be rare again. It will be rare in today's multiples again. 3x net will be rare. It's like it's so pissed me off the way people said, oh, I can see, you know, uh, X can easily be a five to ten billion dollar company, but can it be a 50 billion dollar company? And you're like, five to ten billion. That's a that's a big company. That is a huge success. That was a throwaway comment for something. And what if you own two percent of it and you have a two hundred million dollar, hundred million dollar fund? It won't, 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 won't not going to build you a 10. Then you ask them, OK, how are you going to get a 10 X fund out of that? Great. Hooray. Like, how, how are you going to get a 10 X fund? I don't think most of these folks could even do the math. I, I totally agree with you. I, you said to me before, if your numbers aren't great, you're the product. You said that before. What did you mean by that? Because I thought that was very interesting. As a, as a, as a GP? Yeah. I just remember I told you the story before we met. Like when I first started in venture, the first LP meeting I went to was a huge, a huge entity in New York and Manhattan on the 48th floor of whatever. And we, we came with like a, an 80 page spiral bound notebook of all the strategy and the thesis. And, and all the best, and they just turned to the very end, the last page of the returns, studied it for about 90 seconds, looked up and said, so are you guys IT or biotech? <laughs> like he only cared about the, la the numbers and which are the two buckets of, of this asset category for a slot, right? And so then I'm like, okay, I get it. We're, we're just a product. We're just a product. And um, venture seemed human for a while because when I started doing this, um, doing like we we're solo GPs, but, but emerging managers was seen as crazy. When I started investing in 2013, when, when Semla was crazy, when I started investing, all the LPs I met with talked about homebrew and they're like, well, we love homebrew, but the fund size is too small. We can't make any money in homebrew. We and so homebrew, I, I got to know Hunter and Satya early for different reasons because I wanted to emulate them a bit, but the LPs actually were negative on them, not because they didn't love these guys, but just it, it didn't make, it wasn't worth their time for these small checks. Just like it's not worth your time for a 50 K check or a hundred K check. Cool. And then the crazy numbers and the energy for LPs to do this exploded, right? For three or four years and emerging managers blossomed, right? And everyone wanted to do this. And that may well end now soon. The appetite to go hunt the next Saster or 20 VC or homebrew or cowboy or whatever it is that I wouldn't be shocked. I don't know if Semmel said this. I haven't listened yet, but I will shortly because I want to hear it. I wouldn't be shocked if that evaporates in the next 12 months. If the appetite for the new, the next one just is, is gone. If it's just evaporates at the LP level. It's just like what we're seeing with everyone. Everyone like, yeah, we, we have startups that aren't growing, but Mondays, you know, all, all the top public companies are still growing like a weed because that's where all the budget's going. Right. And all the LP budget similarly may, may, may see a flight to, to trust, to trusted brands and just the energy to write a $5 million check out of a $10 billion endowment. May, may, those days may be gone. <laughs> Those day, those days may be gone. Uh, can I ask you? You know, um, I always think the best discussions are when we're very honest. Yes. My biggest fuck up in this fun cycle was was a company called Airlift in yeah. Pakistan. I thought I knew better. I analyzed the market to the end of the world, the opposite of FTX. I did more diligence yes. than anyone could have done, and actually. I'd never been to Pakistan. I didn't know about the politics in Pakistan. I didn't know about the geo, you know, rain patterns that happen in Pakistan. And it went to nothing. And I yeah. lost all my money. And it was a big lesson for me. What's the biggest fuck up in your fund? I it, listen to the story. I, I don't know the whole Airlift story, but I, I the 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 you, you didn't you didn't go there. Yeah. Okay. 
And I'm not saying you needed to go literally. I think it would have been enough if, if, you, if you'd met halfway. You could have met in Dubai or met in wherever or something with the team. But you cut a corner, and I cut corners during the boom too, right? And all the corners I cut, look, they're not – they're masked by a decent decent fund returns overall. Okay, there that's the that's the one benefit of venture, right? But I think about them every day. The corners I cut, and I regret them. Uh, it was it was obvious I was cutting the corner. Uh, money was too easy to make. Markups were too fast. And How I'm not saying you cut a corner, but no, I, I will I, never I, cut a corner. I will never cut a corner again. And and even though there are minor corners, I I won't. I just won't do it. And 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 it will and it it will impact investment velocity. It will. Uh, it, it makes it harder to invest over Zoom when you won't cut certain corners, right? Yep. But that, that's why I think that my learning from your story, but I might have it wrong. I, Eisenberg at a left, who's a very close friend and an investor in my funds, told me, like, how many of your founders have you met in person? Yeah. And he is very, very intent on this. How do you feel about the need to meet in person in this Zoom invested world? Honestly, Harry, like, I mean, I, I've, I have not figured this out since March 2020. Um, I, what I was very good at with this inbound strategy was getting an inbound thing. And I didn't care where the founder, I invested in Estonia, France, what all these different countries. Um, but when the founders came here from the U S I was often the first one they'd meet. Okay. Off the plane. And even if they went back to Belgium, um, or wherever it was, I, I inherently got all that benefit of, of that socialization from that meeting and that's gone forever. Like the first meetings will never happen in person again, right? No, even if you're in San Francisco, you're all in San they'll never happen. And I'm a worse investor for it. I have not figured out the answer to your question. I will say I'm a worse investor for it. Um, and I don't have all the answer. And what I, what I really don't like is that founders don't care. They don't care. Uh, they, they really don't care if they meet. Uh, investing has gotten so transactional that even if they want you on the cap table, they don't care. They just want to check the boxes and move on. And so I don't have the answer. I, I think some of this advice we get is old school, right? I mean, we have to be thoughtful. The world has changed. We will never go. When I think of what San Francisco was like in, up until in like 2019, like it feels so far in the past now. It feels like they should make a movie about this because this world was so different and, and I still miss it. And I was a better investor in it, but we, we can't go back and you can't meet every founder face to face at the C level. Right. And then I look at friends of ours, like Christoph Jans from point nine, which has ended up developing epic funds after fund and Christoph in the beginning perfected investing all across the world over, over pre zoom over, over go to meeting or whatever we can, we, we can ask him. So obviously it can be done wildly successfully, but you have to countermand that risk in some fashion. Right. And I think taking a high risk without really getting to know folks is risky. On the other hand, I, I do like folks that are like, well, VCs over index on their ability to, 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 to suss up a founder in a face to face. Like it's like walking around, like doing a walk and talk, uh, in, in, in Chelsea or, or wherever East London is so magical that all of a sudden you're, you're such a great student of human nature because so many founders are great bullshit artists, right? <laughs> Sam Blankman, Freed and friends. So it's not that. <laughs> I think so many VCs are as well, my friend. <laughs> what I do think the face-to-face -face does for me, for me is, um, and I think this is what we lost in COVID, is it builds trust. And maybe this is going back to the errors you and I have both made. It builds trust. It's not that I'm such a great judge of character. There's so many different cultures in the world. I don't understand exactly what culture is like in other countries. I do think they're not all, I think entrepreneurs all have kind of the same culture, but I, but I do, th I think that venture is so full of risk. It's so full of, I remember being terrified my first check into pipe drive, it would go into the wrong bank account or this would happen. I, I was still terrified and founders forget that VCs are taking bounded risk, right? It's not the whole fun, but they're taking, they don't get to know you that quickly. It's so risky. And you want to, one is you want to de-risk things for VCs that increases the odds you get a term sheet. But for VCs, man, it's just when you, when you build a relationship, it's just old school sales. When you build a relationship, it goes better, doesn't it? It goes better in the tough times. There's more honesty, there's less baloney. And so when we skip that step, we just never have that relationship. And I, I don't like it. I, I, I don't like it. I want to ask one final question before we do a quick fire back on Algolia. Yeah. But it's, um, I was watching a documentary on JLo yesterday uh, on preparing for um, uh, Super Bowl. And she was talking yeah, about her, I will watch it soon. her continuous fear of being replaced, being the yeah. old guard. I mean this in total respect to you. Yeah. You're V1. I'm V2. Yeah. And what worries the shit out of me is your Sahil Blooms who come along and do Twitter threads yes. and 
<laughs> Jesus, he's got 750,000 followers on Twitter. He shits on both of us yeah. in seconds. And I worry that I'm not the hot one anymore. And yeah. I think it's a good worry. Yeah. I think that worry? just like just like VCs don't have enough time to really get to the level of trust you'd like to investments, founders don't really have enough time to truly understand the nuances of venture. And it makes sense that founders are attracted to the most well, the most loudest VCs, the biggest brands. Everyone's attracted to brands, Harry. And one way you can build a brand is your fund is a brand, right? Sequoia, Sequoia will always be a brand, right? Um, it will be it, 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 for a million reasons, like the business model is insane too, right? But um, building, people mock, so I, I, I think subscale brand building in, in, on VC is a waste of time. Subscale brand building, right? But a top brand is always compelling and founders, founders don't know. F founders are attracted. We're all attracted to brands. And so I think the way we build brand is evolved and you should be worried. And also, you know, not to do too much insider baseball, we're also both products of different types of social media and social media changes. And for example, like as a blog, Saster is still a huge, even though blogs are dead, Saster traffic's insane, right? It is, it is a canonical source of a lot of content, but half of my, probably my deal flow came from Quora in the early days. Quora is dead for B2B. In the early days of Quora, I would write something and you know who would comment on it? Gary Tan and Keith Raboy and David Sachs and Stu Stuart Butterfield and I were on Quora talking about how quickly Slack would grow. Okay. You know, it's all, it's all dog pictures and, uh, and, 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 and weird stuff on core. And I'm still there by myself getting a half a million views a, a month, but, um, but it changes. Right. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, but that's what I think is down to us, Jason. Yeah. It's yeah. changing. And you know, TikTok is the new platform and I have fucking doubled down on it. We buy it's media. Great. I love it. it but, I love but it's it. like, it's like founders job to scale into enterprise, to scale new yeah. products. It is our responsibility to move with platform. Well, I'll, okay. I'll actually answer the question. We, we could talk about platforms. It's a fun conversation. I'll actually answer your question at a, at a little bit more of an existential level. I've thought about it. Okay. Brands matter in venture investing. They do matter. There are, other, there are many ways to invest. Okay. As we talked about brands matter. The thing about brands that I've learned, and we all got brand wrong in SaaS. We all used to make fun of brand in SaaS, but brands last a long time if you nurture them, okay? And so why do I still write Quora posts when, when Gary and Keith and David and Stuart are all long gone? Because some good people are still there, and those 500,000 views a month can source one good deal. It has value beyond venture, okay? But once you have a brand in venture, if you, if you nurture it, whether it's TikTok or doing other things, you your your deal flow might decay to some extent, but it's if you have a top brand, you're going to get into one or two good deals a year by hook or by crook if you play the game, and it's enough. That's the beauty in venture. I think the game in venture is to establish a brand and and keep not let it decay. And you watch what and Dreesen has rebuilt their brand in the time I've been in venture. Excel has rebuilt their brand, and it's enough. It's okay that the top five funds fluctuate a little bit. Like it's not the end of the world. Like they think it's the end of the world, but you're still in. You're still in the game, right? When I started, when I started doing SaaS, I would say Andreessen was at the bottom of the top list that founders wanted. I remember one of my investments was like crushed. That uh, he could get a, get an invest a meeting with Andreessen and not Sequoia today. No way. Like the founders love Andreessen, right? We could compare the results, right? But they love it. So brands go, and so that's the way I would worry less about uh, about ebbs and flows of 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 this and month. But how can you maintain what's special about your your brand in venture if you if you're lucky enough to have one? And it can last a decade. Brands last a decade. I, maybe Mr. Beast will lose his brand in a month, but I doubt it. I think Mr. Beast, he may decay, but he will invest enough in that brand that even in five to seven years, we'll be watching, we'll be watching Mr. Beast, right? I, I know it's a silly example, but... Um, no, no, I think it's a great example. Right. He is the ultimate definition of modern brand execution done well. I think yeah. my final question I just have to ask is like, Jason, are you still the absolute fucking killer inside that you used to be? Like, do you worry that over time you become civilized? Well, I don't think I'm a killer at all. I actually think I'm a so I'm super nice and a softie. It's just I, I can't get anyone else to agree with that uh, analysis. <laughs> uh, I, I think I am. A, yeah, I think if I was a killer, I wouldn't have sold uh, my last startup. I think I'm not a killer. Um, 
at all. Um, yeah. But maybe let me answer it very, more narrowly from a venture perspective. Like, I think your question is, are you as aggressively on the hunt, right? Is, yeah. is a different way to look at it, right? And um, I, I think I've never been aggressively on the hunt. But I think when I started investing, I definitely had a, a sense of fear of failure. Like I was just, you know, Sam Blonde just joined Founders Fund as the newest partner, right? We worked together since the early stages. It was our first SDR. We've been working together a lot of years, okay? And I'm like, what? How does uh, how does it feel like? Like, is there a lot of pressure? He's like, no, but there's like there's pressure to do a deal. It's not this week. <laughs> I mean, times are mellow, but there's he he's got the pressure, right? And I would say I don't feel that pressure today. Like I feel I actually worry every day about my LPs and returns and stuff like that. But I don't feel that same pressure to prove myself as when I started. And I think that's a, probably a net negative. And I think if there's a, there, there is that decay element. And sometimes it comes from money. Sometimes it comes from other things. But um, I do think it creates the most fertile period of investing when you have the maximum hunger. Uh, I don't know if you asked Semmel the question, but I, I'm curious if he is as hungry, if he has the same hunger. He may get even better returns going forward. But I don't know that when I don't know him that well, but I know when I first met him, that hunger was you could it, it was in a good way. Everyone liked him, but you could you could see the hunger coming out of his pores when I first met him at Demo YC Demo Days. Jason, you know me very well by now. You yeah. know twenty V C. If you were to analyze me, what would you yeah. say I could do better or you would change? With twenty V C? Yeah. I s pattern matching's dangerous but i but it, it may be that you may be accidentally making some of the errors i've made and i've still been fairly successful right which is that you may not be building a big enough bench yeah. i remember <laughs> i met with one of my great mentors when things were really hard when saster got too big and too complicated we sat down in maybe 2017 in potrero hill and he was my old ceo and i asked him what i should do he's like well i know your problem like you need a ceo of Saster Media, you need a CEO of events, you need someone running all of the venture funds for you, you need four, you basically need four GMs or CEOs working for you, right? And, um, you know, I have one today, maybe, right? I needed four. And I, I don't think you're going to burn yourself out. But like me, you may you may be under maximizing your platform by and, and creators this if you're a creator, it's especially risky, right? Um, we need we each need four people making thumbnails. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of making fun of that Mr. Beast point to, to make a point. I don't see you having a, the deep enough bench, uh, given what you've accomplished. And it was a failure. It's not too late, like, but it's something I, I think about almost every day. Um, and uh, and I, now that I, I finally kind of have a really good team and everything's dialed in in 2023, I can reflect on the misses there. And I'm like, God, you know, that's, that's the one. And I just, I think the 20 VC empire uh, probably could be, the, the, the downloads might be similar, but I think it could be twice as big if you had three leaders working under you. Three no, great, I, 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 three great I, I, leaders. I, I totally agree. I think it's sourcing high quality candidates who I think are good enough, honestly. Um, so Sorry. anyone so anyone listening who thinks they are good enough, you can ping me. But otherwise, you know, um, we will continue. Uh, Jason, I can talk to you forever. I'm going to do a quick fire with you. So I say a short okay. statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. What was your pre-mortem for Algolia? I've never done a pre-mortem. I don't think I don't. I, I think that the uh, only way a, a B two B startup dies is when the founders kill it. Okay. What did you think when you made I mean, the I, my own startups doing over two hundred million ten years later at Adobe? These things are hard to kill once you give them a little bit of momentum. They're hard to kill. Only founders can kill it. When you made the investment, what did you think yeah. the outcome scenario would be post mortem? Oh well, look. SaaS has gotten so big. The, the other investors thought that 50 million was the highest outcome for Algolia. One of the reasons I was able to invest is because 12 million pre was too high for them. Because a $50 million exit can't support anything much more than a five to $6 million pre money. So the European VCs didn't gobble up the next round because it was too expensive at a $50 million exit. The world has changed. Um, so, but, but none of these investments, I never thought any of them, I thought all of them would get to eventually a billion, but it would take forever. And it would take an IPO. It used to be to get to that they would all have to IPO to be worth a billion, right? Now it's different, baby. Um, who's different. the most underrated investor in Algolia who you've seen deliver real value? I should have a great answer. It's just such a concentrated cap table. I mean, Excel led three rounds. But it, I would say if, if there's a small shout out, it would, okay, it would definitely be Alex Kyle from Salesforce Ventures. He has huh. been, a, Salesforce Ventures has so many, so many companies, right? He has been a champion to Algolia since well before they invested, since he's been a board observer. 
And when we had a Rocky round, you know, I was the first one in the C, but I was also the first one in the C. He also came in very early when Salesforce didn't need to, right? Salesforce doesn't need to be a, a leader, a follower, right? And so we were the first two investors in a Rocky round. And that's pretty cool to see out of a seemingly corporate VC, right? So I would give Alex from Salesforce Ventures the, by far the biggest shout out. What was the single hardest moment in the Algolia journey? Nothing. I'm not a founder. It's easy. It's easy. <laughs> um, but but I think I think for them, the toughest part was when that when that first management team, which because they had so much momentum, they recruited so late, right? At 30 or 40 million. When, when really none of that team worked out, it was it almost wrecked the company. It was tough on them, right? Algolia in 10 years' time, Jason. What does it look like? 2032. I think it'll be a fun one for them to figure out. I think um, the market will change so much. Um, the, you know, what's fun about, one of the things that's fun about Algolia, I know I'm giving you too long of an answer, is some things are obvious, but search is one of the five most biggest problems on the internet, but there's not that many vendors. So where, where they're searching and where it goes in 10 years, honestly, I, I couldn't predict. This is just why it's, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that the CTO who's the co-founder is still one of the technical leaders of the company because you need that agile mind. But I have no idea. I have no idea. Other than that, I think the two largest verticals for Algolia are e-commerce and SaaS. And no matter what it looks like in the press, these are great verticals right? You, they're going to attack, they're going to grow organically with e-commerce, which has resumed growth since its peak. And we got a good run in SaaS, right? So you like these ones that get these tailwinds from markets and um, they've got two, they've got two to kind of counterbalance each other as, as they have relative strengths in the market. Jason, I, I, I'm so grateful for our friendship. I really mean that, you know, seven years we said at the beginning, but genuinely you were one of the first people to believe in me. I'm sure you're probably disgraced at how I've turned out. <laughs> it's, it's, but, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see. It's great. But, but honestly, it means the world to me. And so thank you for always being there for me. I don't think I tell you enough and I really appreciate today.